Welcome to the Gold Collar Investor Podcast. This is your host, Pancham. Really appreciate you for tuning in today. My guest is Cody Laughlin uh, on the show. He uh, he is the head of deal acquisitions for Blue Oak Capital and has been active real estate investor for over 10 years. Cody's investing thesis is focused exclusively on investing in value-add multifamily assets his current he currently retains ownership interests in 390 391 multifamily units as a journal partner hi cody welcome to the show pachan thank you so much for having me excited to be here absolutely so before we get started are you ready to fire up my listener break out of wall street investments let's make it happen man let's do it let's do this so you know why don't you start with your background and more importantly, the person behind that background? Absolutely. Well, I am a Houston native now. Um, I've originally from Southwest Louisiana, migrated here to Houston back in 2008 to pursue a career in healthcare as a healthcare professional. And at the time I had just graduated college, me and my wife um, just got married and uh, we were looking to start a new life here in Houston. And I was going to continue my educational uh, path to go and get my master's degree, further my education, and kind of go up the corporate healthcare ladder. And then fast forward to 2010, uh, my wife and I became accidental landlords when we tried to sell our home that we bought in 2008. And we had purchased another home and we couldn't sell it. And we were started to panic because, you know, we were just young into our careers. We weren't in a great financial state by any stretch of the means, we couldn't pay, we couldn't afford to pay two mortgages. So we said, Hey, we're going to put a tenant in this thing and then we'll, we'll figure it out from there. And that was kind of the first introduction into real estate investing and had no idea what we were doing, no idea about being a landlord, but I knew, Hey, there's somebody paying my mortgage, you know, and covering my expenses for the most part. And uh, I thought that was a pretty unique concept. So I started studying uh, more about real estate, uh, you know, investing and, and came across the, what I like to call the purple Bible, the rich dad, poor dad uh, by Robert Kiyosaki. And it kind of opened my eyes to financial literacy, right? It kind of really um, just shocked me, uh, so to speak, as far as, you know, what I was taught growing up about what is financial independence and financial security was just really completely misled. And so that kind of led me to pursue real estate entrepreneurship since, and I got their entrepreneurship bug and started kind of going down that path, but along the way, chased a bunch of shiny objects, uh, you know, pursued a bunch of non-real estate related ventures and uh, a bunch of strategies that were not a fit for my skill set. And uh, I, I can smile about it now and say, I learned a lot of expensive lessons along the way, but um, you know, through that, it kind of helped, uh, helped shape me to where I am today and helped shape the investor I am today. And so, you know, to, to sum all that up, um, I'm a very active real estate investor. I'm the managing, one of the managing partners at our company, Blue Oak Capital. I'm also the director of acquisitions. Uh, we are a private, privately held um, private equity group here in Houston. And our focus is on the acquisition of um, A and B class multifamily assets here across central Texas. So that's awesome. So are you still practicing? Uh, did you graduate from healthcare? Did you like, are you still in that space or when did you quit that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm still a healthcare provider now. Um, I'm slowly making the transition out. I'm a part-time employee now. Um, and I will hopefully uh, be fully transitioned out of the W2 by the end of 2023. And, you know, right now for us, everything that we're doing is uh, for growth and expansion when it comes to our company. So we've kept all revenue in our company so we can continue to push our platform and expand our platform. And so um, for now, the, the W-2 provides me a, you know, a fixed income while we continue to grow the business. So got it. So I want to go back to your first house, right, that you bought in 2008. So the market was tanking like it was in the beginning of the you know decline i would say or not fully declined let's put it that way and when you went out and sell it you said that you couldn't sell it the reason you couldn't sell it it probably was 
valued lower than what you owed on that house at the time or what was the reason well if if you remember you know the great financial crisis was related to a credit crisis right the credit markets had just completely bottomed out you know we had terrible lending practices you know on you know these terrible loans that were that were given out to people who shouldn't have been borrowing and and what ended up happening is the the entire credit market seized right and so mm-hmm. for us the home itself you know had it still had a somewhat of a value as far as its market value but really we just couldn't find a buyer that was credit worthy you know couldn't get a mm-hmm. loan and that was the biggest thing is it couldn't get a loan um you know we couldn't find anybody that you know really met a certain credit profile for you know borrowers uh, or for the lender excuse me so you know ultimately we just we said hey the fastest route um or a way to get out of that circumstance was just to put a, a tenant in there and, and kind of take it from there and i'm so thankful that we did because i ended up holding that single family home for 10 years and oh, you know and as we all know after the recovery of the great financial crisis, you know, real estate has been on a very steady accelerated uh, growth pattern as far as appreciation goes. So I made a very good exit on that single family home. And, uh, you know, it ended up being a really good uh, investment long term, uh, which is the fundamentals of real estate anyway. So got it. Got it. So given that you started with that purple book and you got the bug. You tried many different things, shiny objects, you said, along the way. When, like, walk us through the path, like, you know, people who are listening and they're getting excited hearing your story, given that you are you have a W-2 and, you know, a lot of listeners on the show, uh, they may want to follow the path that you you have, right? You have gone through and you're towards the tail end of, you know, getting away from your W-2, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, How did it start, right? Like, I know you said that you got that house, you became an accidental landlord, and you got the purple Bible, right, Rich said for that. And like, where you you are today to where you were at the time, like, what was the path that you took? Was it you directly got into multifamily, did you start buying more single family homes? Like what happened? Like walk us through that. Yeah. I wish I'd have bought more multifamily then because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have been in a much better position as far as our portfolio now, but no, you know, I, I started with the one home. And as I started studying more about this idea or concept of real estate investing, um, you know, really having no experience, no education, no knowledge around, you know, this particular vertical, Um, I started getting involved in local networks, right? And I started going to local community uh, networking events and things like that to try to learn as much as I could. And I actually joined a mentorship program around 2011, I believe. And yeah, and and the sole focus of, of that program was really around residential real estate, single family homes and the, the multiple strategies in building out a single family uh, portfolio. And, and at the time, I really didn't know anything about this world of commercial real estate, you know? And so I was, I was really trying to find my niche, you know, what was my, what was the one strategy that really fit my skill set? And at the time I didn't know what my skill set was. And so the, the problem I was having was I was trying to stretch myself thin, trying to do all these different strategies from wholesale to, you know, um, you know, looking at fix and flip to going with a burr strategy, like just doing all these various verticals, trying to figure out how I can find any momentum. And it, it really was, it delayed my ability to kind of get to the next step, you know, and, and I was just stretching myself too thin and not really becoming an expert at one, one niche. And um, so, so that was a learning curve for me. That was, you know, something, some trials that I had to go through and, and really again, learn a lot of hard lessons along the way. Um, But I did get introduced to commercial real estate in 2012. I'm at a networking event, the guy's on stage and he stands up on stage and he says, hey, I just bought this, you know, $20 million building with 17 other partners. And, you know, here's how much money everybody's going to make. And I was like, oh man, that makes so much sense. That sounds so much better than what I'm doing now, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that was my introduction to, the commercial real estate space. But at 
at the time I had such a limited mindset. I was like, man, I don't have any capital. I don't have any experience. I don't have a network of people I can go raise money from. So I'm just going to stick with single family until I can build enough capital to go invest in commercial. And looking back now, then that was the complete uh, wrong mindset. You know, I, I, I can tell you now you can do this without any of those things, you know, but, but again, you have to kind of go through those trials and tribulations. So long, long winded answer to your question, but I, I stuck with the residential space for a long period of time, chasing a bunch of different verticals before finding my way into apartment syndication. Got it. So was it after that seminar in 2012 that you decided that you will do this and you were just waiting to get into it for the right time? Or did something else happen after four or five, whenever you started doing multifamily to actually get into it and get going? It, it, when, I, when I discovered it, it set a new goal for me. It, instead of thinking about, oh, I want to get you know, 50 or 100 single family homes, it, I started thinking like, hey, how do I get to go buy the 100 unit building? You know, that makes a lot more sense, but how do I get to that path? But the, the challenge for me, again, being very young, having this new entrepreneurship fire lit inside me that I, I was just less focused. And then that's kind of led me into that story about chasing the shiny objects. I started looking at any and everything that, that said, hey, you could produce a certain return or you could produce this much uh, passive income. Mm -hmm. and, and I started kind of going down those paths and they ended up all being dead ends. I mean, you know, let's face it. They ended up being, like I said, very expensive lessons <laughs> that, yeah. that result that resulted in very little return on that time and effort. But the, the, the critical moment for me was roughly around, I think 2018, I had been doing, you know, kind of chasing my tail, so to speak for all these years, trying to find my way in, into some niche that, that was going to help me get to my end goal. And, and I started to really just dwell on the fact that like, man, I'm, I'm working at a W2 and I have a family at this time I'm married, you know, I've been married for several years. I have a couple of kids uh, at that time. And like, I'm just trading my time for money. You know, I'm, I'm so tired of, of having to go to the W2 clock in clock out when somebody else tells me to tell me somebody else telling me what my time and efforts are worth and, and then go back to my family and miss out on family time because you know, I'm, I'm a slave to the W-2, right? And, and I just got tired of, of going through that grind. And that was really the inflection point for me where I really had to make a decision and say, look, I need to get serious about my investing. I really need to get serious about building a business that will allow me to get out of my W-2. And then that's where I became laser focused and really disciplined and, um, you know, creating a beelined path to building a real estate investing business. And that's when we made the transition to commercial real estate. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been all up since then. So. Awesome. Awesome. Th that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty, you know, typical and also pretty inspiring, right? That you, you made that uh, leap into this. And I want to talk about your first multifamily deal numbers, but before I do that, let me ask you this question. So, you know, I've interviewed many different people and I have walked the path where I've quit my W-2 uh, and it was an extremely difficult decision to make for me at the time because, you know, how you get <laughs> that uh, paycheck feeling, right, are constantly coming in and uh, it's very hard to kind of leave those golden handcuffs, uh, get out of them. Um, but if you ask me today, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, what would I have done differently? And I, my answer is, which a lot of people will say, and I truly mean that I should have quit earlier, right? Sooner. So what, what is it that's stopping you from quitting now versus like, is there a certain goal that you're trying to reach before you quit? Like, what is that you're chasing for you to kind of, get to a point where you will say, okay, now is the time. And the reason I ask this question is because a lot of people potentially in your boat uh, might be there and everyone's journey is different. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very good question. And I'm so glad that you've asked that because there, you have to be very strategic about making that decision. Right. And 
if you if you think about growing a business, a, a successful businesses need capital. They need a steady flow of revenue coming in to sustain. So, so there's an inflection point for every business that is critical when it when you talk about taking a salary from your business, right? You know, your business to in order for it to succeed needs a steady income. It needs a steady revenue to generate um, sustainable income, so that way you can continue to grow. And when you when you take a salary, assuming you would take a salary from your company or your business. When you're leaving your W-2, you know, I'd imagine you have some type of lifestyle that you're trying to sustain, you know, with your W-2 income, you have to replace that with something. So when you start taking a salary from your business, if your business is not at a point of scale where there's steady revenue coming in, then it could stipend your growth as a company and ultimately could lead you down a negative path and ultimately your business could fail. So for me... I, I think of my fixed income as, as a, a steady stream of income for me to not only sustain my lifestyle at home, you know, as a father and three kids, you know, I have responsibilities that I have to care for. I can still use my W-2 to give me that fixed income to supply for my family, give my kids everything that they need while all revenue stays within our company. So that way we continue to grow. You know, so for us, the goal is to get to a certain point of scale um, to where when I do take that salary position, it's not going to stipend the growth of the business. And, and I don't think that we're there yet. And so we want to give it a little bit more time. We want to definitely get a couple more acquisitions under our belt uh, before we get there. And, and then also bring on some payroll and some staff first. That way it, we can further support the growth of the business. And then we can, you know, continue the momentum from there. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And do you have, are you chasing a certain number, like for the from a revenue perspective or number of doors perspective or assets under management? Like, do you have a goal or it's more like, you know, uh, you kind of do check in regularly and kind of figure out what that is? Yeah, you know, it's a great question as well. And I, I think there are some internal goals that we have, you know, when we would consider like a per certain point of scale. But really, I mean, you know, with anything with business related, right? I mean, you could have a great quarter, great two quarters, and then you can have a, a negative quarter, right? You can have something that impacts your business and such. And so I think it kind of ebbs and flows. So for us, it's something that we're always constantly evaluating. We're always constantly looking at our, our quarterly budgets as well as our annual budgets to see where we're at as far as you know, net cash flow and net uh, cash balances for our company. And um, I think you know, it, because we look at it so frequently, it's kind of one of those decisions that we'll just make um, as we continue to grow each quarter. You know? So um, I think once you hit a certain level of scale, though, like especially when you get to, let's say, $100 million of assets under your management, that's usually where you typically see a sustainable revenue stream coming in to where, uh, you know, your business can sustain it and support itself. Um, and then you can look at taking a salary. So I think that's kind of our big goal is to get to that $100 million mark first and then, uh, then maybe sit down and reevaluate. Got it. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. So now going back to my question on like, do, do you mind uh, sharing numbers on your first multifamily deal, how it looked and, and how did you get the capital for that one? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, with, with commercial real estate investing, you need three th key, three, three key things, excuse me. You need experience, net worth, and liquidity. Right. And so in the commercial real estate space, the biggest thing between a residential investor and the commercial investor is you know, you're dealing with multiple million dollar um, transactions, right? And so the barrier to entry is so much higher in the commercial real estate space. So you really need partnerships. You really need a network of people that you can partner with to take down these larger deals. And so I say all that to bring back to your question is, you know, when we were getting started, we spent about the first two years kind of really building what we call the infrastructure of our business. You know, who are we as a brand? Who are we as a company? You know, what are the skill sets we need as a team uh, to continue to, to like grow the business and, and find our way into opportunities and, and build 
we, we spend a lot of time building relationships and this is key, right? You know, a lot of relationships, especially with people that were already doing deals. And so we knew that our fastest and easiest way into getting that first deal was to partner with somebody else who was already successful. So we co-sponsored um, with another operator that's here in our local market in Houston, who had already had a couple thousand units that he's acquired and managed here in Houston. We built a relationship with them and we approached them and said, look, you know, we spent two years building a database. We think that we can add uh, a value to you in your next acquisition by raising capital. You know, um, would you allow us to come into your, op your deal and partner with you so we can get our foot in the door so we can learn from you and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough that he gave us that opportunity. And so we did, we raised equity for that. We participated in the asset management. And, and that was the first introduction into that, uh, into commercial real estate. So that was an $18.6 million acquisition. Uh, I think the total equity as a, as a partnership was, I think, $6 million is what we brought to that deal. And, uh, you know, for our and our team, we brought a little over a million, uh, like a million two for that deal in equity out of our own database uh, to participate in that deal. And it was a big undertaking. It was nerve wracking because it was our first true raise at, as a team at Blue Oak Capital. Um, but I'm so thankful that we did because once once that deal closed, that was that was a deal that could go on your resume. It puts you in the game. And then from there, we found ourselves in two other partnerships following that. And shortly thereafter, we found our own acquisition uh, as the lead sponsors. Well, we actually found the deal, acquired the deal, you know, and then raised the uh, money and the partners for the team to get that deal done. And so uh, it was the catapult yeah. for sure. Exactly. The first one is the hardest, right? And that's the, it takes, uh, uh, it follows pretty quickly. So are you doing your own deals now or are you still co-sponsoring with people? Like what, what's the goal for Blue Oak Capital? Yeah, so we're very much acquisition based. Uh, we're focused on our own acquisition pipeline, but you know we always like to say we love partnering with good people and good deals, and so we're open to partnering with other people as well, especially with people outside of our target markets. You know, we're focused mm -hmm. on Central Texas, and there's other markets that we absolutely love: Phoenix, Florida, Carolinas. But it's just such a competitive landscape out there that I'm not going to be able to realistically go build a footprint in those markets and compete against the local boots on the ground there. So, but if somebody brought us an opportunity from those markets to partner, oh yeah, we'd absolutely jump on that. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks for sharing your uh, background uh, and uh, what you're up to now. Um, is there anything that you would like to add before we move on to the second part of the show? Yo, no, I know we were talking a little bit before the show, you know, looking at your audience, uh, you know, as a whole and, and kind of what their various backgrounds are. I think for anybody that's interested in investing in commercial real estate, um, you know, I think this is a phenomenal vertical to add to your, your portfolio, your investment portfolio, you know, and if you take a look at what's happening in the equities markets, crypto markets right now, uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of volatility. And I think commercial real estate uh, can provide you a little bit more predictable uh, return patterns and a little bit more uh, comfort knowing that it's just not as volatile as those markets. So I think it's a great addition to your portfolio. Anybody and everybody should have real estate as a part of their uh, portfolio. So Awesome. Well, thanks uh, for that. So Cody, let's move on to the second part of the show, which I call taking the leap round. I ask these four questions to every guest on the show. My first question for you is, when was the first time you invested outside of Wall Street? Was it that home that you bought in 2008? It was, it was. Yeah, at the time, I right when I started my healthcare career, I started putting money in a 401k because that's what everybody told me to do. And when I found real estate, I was like, oh, that makes so much more sense. And so I can, I have so much more control and predictability. And uh, that was my first investment outside of Wall Street. And man, thank God I did it. Awesome. Awesome. So did you have any fears at the time to overcome when you did that? Yeah, you know, th there was some hesitation and there was some fear because, you know, the traditional financial model uh, was centered around putting your money into retirement accounts, putting it in the stock market or 401k, 
and you know you give it to a financial advisor and you you know you hope that when you're ready to retire your your portfolio will be able to sustain your retirement and um so there was there was some hesitation because anytime you take control of your own you know investments or your whatnot i mean you're putting you're putting the risk in your hands right and so um, it, it was some nerve wracking moments at first, but, um, you know, I think that's with anything. And, and if you're anytime that you're growing and expanding, whether it be investing or anything in life, it's always going to be uncomfortable, you know, until you do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So my third question for you is, can you share with us one investment that did not go as expected? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got several, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, I pursued a bunch of non-real estate related ventures. Um, I actually um, had purchased the rights to a multi-unit package franchise agreement uh, for a mm. fitness franchise back in 2015. And um, really, I've always loved health and fitness. I love the idea of owning a business like a gym, for example, a fitness center. And so I came across a a brand that uh, I was very familiar with that I, you know, really liked. And I spent a lot of time in the, in the fitness centers then. And so I was like, Hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, you know, start me a, a, a fitness gym, you know? And uh, so I bought a multi-unit package um, and to make a very long story short with that, that's a whole nother podcast episode. Uh, I spent about three years trying to, um, you know, build momentum in that space and ended up not opening a single unit out of that, out of that franchise packet. And it cost me probably about $120,000 after it was all said and done, uh, that I completely lost. So that was, that was a hard one. That was a real life seminar and you know, it was, <laughs> it's hard, it's hard, you know, but you learn so much from that. Yeah. I, I'm thankful for the experience now. Cause looking back, um, you, the best money, the best lessons you ever learn are the ones that, uh, where you lose money. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So my last question for you, Cody, is what is one piece of advice would you give to people who are thinking of investing in Main Street that is outside of Wall Street? Investing in what? In Main Street, basically in anything outside of Wall Street in real assets. Yeah. Listen, I, like I was mentioning to you earlier, I think anybody should absolutely have real assets as a part of your investment portfolio. You know, I, I don't try to encourage anybody to completely divest from equities. If you like equities or crypto, hey, that's great. But you definitely should have real assets in your portfolio to hedge against some of the volatility and unpredictability that you experience in those markets, right? And look at the inflationary environment we're in now. Real assets are a perfect hedge against an inflationary environment. And so, you know, you definitely should be considering adding that to your investment portfolio and, and, you know, just get educated, you know, surround yourself with other investors that are, you know, pursuing the verticals that you're interested in and, and start networking. And I think that's a great way to, um, you know, help with that transition. Awesome. Well, thank you, Cody, for, for sharing your knowledge and, and background here on the podcast. If someone's interested in getting in touch with you, uh, how can they connect? Well, I want to thank you again for having me, man. This is a great conversation. really appreciate it. If you want to connect with me directly, I'm not hard to find. Uh, we're very visible on social media. You can find me on LinkedIn or Facebook at Cody Laughlin. But if you want to reach out to me directly, feel free to email me at Cody at BlueOakInvest.com. Great. Thank you, Cody, for your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.